Our next draft safety alert, reduced visual references require vigilance, addresses the problem of fatal accidents that occur in reduced visibility weather conditions. Historically, about two-thirds of all GA accidents that occur in such weather conditions are fatal. These accidents typically involve pilot spatial disorientation or controlled flight into terrain. Mr. Chris Shaver will present the first accident scenario. Thank you. Shortly into a VFR cross-country flight, an Aero Commander 680 FL airplane collided with mountainous terrain and daylight instrument meteorological conditions about seven miles north of Paris, California. The airline transport pilot was killed and the airplane was substantially damaged. The flight was being operated under provisions of Part 91 with no flight plan filed. The flight was the pilot's second attempt at returning the airplane to its home base after the first attempt required a weather diversion to Palm Springs the previous day. The pilot had accumulated more than 33,000 flight hours, held an airline transport pilot certificate with multiple type ratings, was instrument current, and had recent experience in the accident airplane. There was no record that the pilot obtained an official weather briefing prior to the flight, though he did tell a customer service agent at the fixed base operator, or FBO, to hold a rental car for him in case he needed to return to the airport because of weather. About the time of departure, the Palm Springs airport was reporting VFR conditions. Weather stations along the pilot's initial intended flight route were reporting marginal VFR conditions with ceilings that varied between 1,500 and 2,500 feet above ground level. NEXRAD weather radar images showed that an area of concentrated precipitation surrounded the area of the accident site at the time of the accident. GPS data recovered from a portable receiver on board the airplane provided information about the flight path. This map shows the accident airplane's flight path in red and surface roadways are shown in yellow. The airplane departed from Palm Springs and headed west along a highway corridor through a mountain valley pass. For the majority of the flight, the airplane maintained altitudes that kept it about 900 to 1200 feet above the valley floor, but below the peaks that surrounded the highway corridor. About three minutes before the airplane collided with terrain, the airplane's flight track turned to the southwest, away from a concentrated area of precipitation, but directly towards a small isolated mountain with a 2,700-foot peak that rose 1,000 feet above the surrounding terrain. This map shows the airplane's flight path during the final minutes of the accident flight, beginning in the upper right corner of the map. About one minute before the airplane impacted terrain, the pilot reported to an air traffic controller that he was having difficulty maintaining VFR, and he asked for an IFR clearance. The airplane was already in close proximity to the train at this time, and no further communication was received from the pilot. The airplane impacted terrain near the crest of the mountain peak. This photograph shows the airplane's wreckage debris field near the summit of the mountain. The NTSB determined that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's decision to continue visual flight into instrument meteorological conditions which resulted in an in-flight collision with mountainous terrain. In looking at this accident, there are a number of missed opportunities that could have changed the outcome of this flight. There was no record that the pilot obtained an official weather briefing. However, he appeared to have at least some awareness of the possibility of adverse weather along his flight route, as evidenced by his request that a rental car be held for him in case he needed a return because of weather. Although the pilot's request to hold the rental car shows he did plan ahead with a flight cancellation alternative, it's interesting to note that he decided first to attempt the flight rather than cancel it before using that alternative. There were external pressures on the pilot to complete the flight because the airplane needed to be returned to its home base. However, it is not known why he was motivated to complete the flight that day. And although the pilot asked to pick up an IFR clearance in flight, he had allowed the situation to become dangerous before he made that decision to act. By the time that he made his request, it was too late. He had already encountered the adverse weather 
and the terrain collision was imminent. When we look at the lessons that can be taken from this accident, it really all comes down to decision making. More so, it's about making the right decisions at the right time. And if there's any doubt about the weather, and if you can accomplish a flight VFR, that should immediately trigger something in your mind to reevaluate the situation, your competencies, and the airplanes, and either cancel the flight or make the flight under instrument flight rules. Taking off into marginal weather to quote unquote take a look should never be an option. When things start to go wrong, as in this case, you've already passed the right time to make a good decision. And it's important to remember that you never have to be anywhere when flying an airplane. The next speaker will be Mr. Dennis Diaz. Good morning. In July 2011, a Cessna 182S impacted trees and terrain during a flight that was conducted in dark night visual meteorological conditions. The certificated instrument rated private pilot and the passenger were returning home from a vehicle auction and were both fatally injured. Shortly after departing on the accident flight, the pilot requested VFR flight following services from air traffic control and stated that his destination was Columbus, Georgia. About 25 minutes after departing, radio contact with the pilot was lost after air traffic control issued the pilot a frequency change. GPS data recovered from a portable receiver provided information about the flight. This map shows the airplane's flight path in red. The airplane departed from Meridian, Mississippi and shortly thereafter, radio contact was lost here. Upon reaching Columbus, Georgia, the airplane turned northeast toward Irwin, North Carolina. Sunset and the end of civil twilight occurred nearly one hour before the airplane reached Irwin, near this point. The moon did not rise until about one hour after the accident. A witness who landed at Irwin about one hour after the accident reported that the area to the southwest of the runway was a black hole due to the lack of ground lighting and stated that flying in the area could be very disorienting. This map shows the airplane's flight track as it approached Irwin. The airplane initially intercepted and tracked down the final approach course to runway 5. The airplane then began maneuvering in the vicinity of the runway, turning southeast, back northwest, and again southeast, while climbing and descending to altitudes that varied between 1,300 and 2,500 feet. The airplane crossed the final approach course for the final time at an altitude of 2,000 feet. This graphic shows the airplane's flight path during the final seconds of the flight, beginning at the top of the map. After crossing the final approach path to runway 5 for the final time, the airplane entered a descending right turn. The radar observed descent rate during that turn exceeded 4,800 feet per minute as the airplane descended from an altitude of 2,000 feet. The airplane subsequently impacted trees and terrain in a right bank about one half mile from the runway threshold. The main wreckage came to rest partially submerged in the Cape Fear River about 700 feet beyond the initial impact point. This photograph shows the wreckage of the airplane as viewed from the south bank of the river. And this photograph shows a portion of the wreckage after it was recovered to the shore of the river. A review of the 79-year-old pilot's flight logs showed that he had not logged any flights within the eight months preceding the accident flight. The logs also showed that the pilot's most recent flight review was completed nearly five years before the accident flight. While the pilot did hold an instrument rating, there were no records of the pilot having completed an instrument proficiency check the log also showed that the pilot had only two-tenths of an hour of flight experience at night within the preceding year. 
The NTSB determined that the probable cause of the accident was the pilot's loss of control due to spatial disorientation while maneuvering in dark night conditions. The investigation also discovered that the airplane's audio system was configured in a way that would not have allowed the pilot to contact air traffic control facilities or activate the pilot controlled lighting at Irwin Airport, as can be seen in this photograph. If the pilot had inadvertently configured the system in this way, it might account for his loss of communications earlier in the flight and for his maneuvering in the vicinity of the airport as he attempted to activate the pilot-controlled lighting there in vain. In looking at this accident, there are a number of opportunities where the pilot could have changed the outcome of the flight. First, it is possible that the pilot may not have fully understood how to operate all of the onboard systems, including the audio panel. While this may seem innocuous on the surface, as this accident has evidenced, when compounded with other decisions, resulted in a tragic outcome. After encountering communication abnormalities, the pilot could have diverted, diverted the flight to a nearby airport or could have landed at one of the many airports he overflew en route to Irwin. The pilot also could have terminated the flight prior to nightfall in order to troubleshoot the problem on the ground, possibly with the help of another pilot or a mechanic. Upon reaching the destination, and not being able to activate the airport's pilot-controlled lighting, the pilot could have diverted to another airport where continuous night lighting was provided and where such a disorienting, non-groundlet area was not present. As a pilot and flight instructor, I can appreciate the challenges pilots face in managing the risks associated with each flight and balancing those risks with the practical considerations of trying to make it to a business meeting, return home to family, or when just flying for the fun of it. As an air safety investigator, I have the unique opportunity to see firsthand what happens when pilots are unsuccessful in managing those risks. When an accident occurs in reduced visibility conditions, the results are often fatal, which when juxtaposed against how easily preventable these accidents are, makes them particularly tragic. Additionally, no pilot is immune to the dangers of flying in reduced visibility conditions. These accidents have taken the lives of countless student, instrument rated, and even airline transport pilots, their friends, and family. I truly believe that by following the suggestions provided in the safety alerts we are discussing today, every pilot can take one step towards making their flight safer and reduce the likelihood that they or their families will ever have to meet me in a professional capacity. Mr. Elliot Simpson will now present a spatial disorientation accident. Good morning. About noon on April 7th, 2008, an experimental amateur-built Vans RV-10 was destroyed when it impacted trees and terrain in Seal, Alabama during an instrument approach into Columbus Metropolitan Airport in Georgia. The airplane departed Lebanon, Lebanon Tennessee about two hours prior with an intended destination of Eufaula, Alabama. The private pilot and pilot-rated passenger builder sustained fatal injuries. This is one of the first RV-10 airplanes, kit airplanes to be completed, and it was equipped with glass cockpit primary and backup flight instruments. The flight was intended to be a cross-country trip to Sun and Fun with Eufaula as a first stop. The approach portion was flown in daylight IMC, and an IFR flight plan had been filed. The pilot had accrued a total of about 1,700 flight hours. He was instrument current, and about one quarter of his flight time was in actual IMC conditions. However, the majority of his prior IFR, exp IFR experience was in his personal airplane, a Cessna Cardinal, which was equipped with conventional instruments. He did not have prior flight experience in the accident airplane or type. The passenger was a private pilot with no instrument rating. He had accumulated about 70 hours of flight time in the airplane. He was the co-builder, and he appeared well-versed in the airplane's operation. 
Now, for the first two hours of flight, VMC conditions prevailed. While the I and while the arrival area was VMC with visibilities of about 8 miles, 1,000 foot ceilings, and 4,500 foot cloud tops, the approach required a descent into IMC conditions. Here we can see the airplane's GPS flight track in red, indicating the entire 300 mile long flight. The data indicated that the autopilot was most likely engaged during this initial cruise segment. The approach, the approach descent into IMC occurred about 25 minutes prior to the accident, as can be indicated by the orange bracket. In this image, we can see the flight track for the final 20 minutes of flight, covering about a 30-mile radius. The green dotted line indicates the radial for the Eufaula VR runway 18 instrument approach. And as can be seen by the track data, the pilot was clearly experiencing difficulty maintaining a stabilized approach. He ultimately requested vectors to Auburn, but while en route, he requested a diversion to an airport with an ILS approach. He was subsequently cleared for the Columbus ILS-6, the localizer of which is indicated in blue. Again, he appeared to experience difficulty executing the approach with the ultimate wreckage location indicated by the white circle. This flight track of the last three minutes of flight paints a fairly graphic picture of the airplane's final moments. The last turn was consistent with a hook maneuver, which we often observe during, the observe during the final stages of a spatial disorientation accident. On multiple occasions throughout the last 14 minutes of flight, the airplane devi deviated approximately 400 feet above and 1,200 feet below its assigned altitude. The controller twice relayed low altitude alert warnings and on five occasions alerted the pilot that he was not maintaining the assigned headings. The debris path was about 440 feet long, and the airplane was heavily fragmented. The NTSB determined the probable cause as the pilot's loss of airplane control due to spatial disorientation. One of the contributing factors was also his lack of flight experience in the accident airplane. Missed opportunities. The pilot did not declare an emergency at any point during the flight. Air traffic control personnel did provide the required assistance. However, the pilot's declaration of an emergency would have provided them further cues as to his plight and prompted additional resources to become available. Additionally, the pilot did not initiate a climb into VMC, even though the cloud tops were relatively low. And as mentioned, the pilot had no documented glass cockpit or type experience. In my experience, the pilot had an unusually high number of actual IMC flight time for a general aviation pilot. Conversely, although the pilot-rated passenger had extensive knowledge of the airplane, he would not have been familiar with flying an instrument approach. As such, the cross-pollination of pilot and passenger experience meant that while the flight was perfectly legal, embarking on it was not necessarily advisable. In the last four years, I've investigated nine fatal accidents where spatial disorientation was causal. Four of these involved airplanes equipped with glass cockpits. When transitioning into a glass cockpit, training is crucial. Don't assume that if you can use an iPad, you can easily operate a glass panel. In fact, a recent NTSB study concluded that training in conventional cockpits does not prepare pilots for safe, safe operation of the many complex and varied glass cockpit systems available. In conclusion, it's easy with hindsight to pass judgment on the mistakes of other pilots. However, although they probably wouldn't like to admit it, many of my fellow inv investigators have themselves at one time or another come close to being a statistic in the NTSB database. I, for one, would not be alive if it wasn't for the valuable lessons I learned early in my flying career after reading and learning from the NTSB report of one particular high-profile spatial disorientation accident. So even though today we'll be discussing the many practical ways pilots can mitigate risk, I would urge at minimum that pilots simply make a habit of reading and learning from the mistakes of others. The three accidents that staff just presented are summarized in the draft safety alert, reduced visual references require vigilance. The safety alert also provides links to educational resources and it offers pilots the following advice. 
Obtain an official pre-flight weather briefing and use all appropriate sources of weather information to make timely in-flight decisions. Do not allow a situation to become dangerous before deciding to act. Be honest with air traffic controllers about your situation and ask for help if you need it. Remember that when flying at night, even visual weather conditions can be challenging. When planning a night VFR flight, use topographic references to familiarize yourself with the surrounding terrain. Consider following instrument pr procedures if you are instrument rated or avoiding areas with limited ground lighting if you are not. Be honest with yourself about your skill limitations. Plan ahead with cancellation or diversion alternatives and brief passengers about those alternatives before the flight. Seek training to ensure that you are proficient and fully understand the features and limitations of the equipment in your aircraft, particularly the avionics, autopilot systems, and weather information equipment. Manage distractions. Many accidents result when a pilot is distracted momentarily from the primary task of flying. This concludes the staff presentations on this safety alert topic. We're prepared to answer your questions at this time.